Good morning. This is John Hesse, Cahoka Presbyterian Church. Uh, we're glad to have you following along. <clears throat> and, and, and we always encourage anyone who hears any message uh, to check that message, re uh, regardless of the speaker, regardless of of who that person or persons are affiliated with, what whatever denomination or non-denominational organization, to check that message by the unchanging word of God. Because as human beings, we're prone to make mistakes. And sometimes as human beings, and sometimes as human organizations, we go against God's clearly written word. Uh, and, and so it is important to keep the good and to throw away the bad. Um, that, that's important in everything in life, and, and I encourage anyone who's listening to do that. Today we'll be reading from Daniel 9, 26 through 10, verse 3. And we might get through all of it, and we might not. Uh, the title of the message is Fulfill Covenant 2. Uh, before we read, I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that we can trust in you, that we can trust in your word, that we can build our lives on you, the solid foundation, that your written word is a reflection of you as the living word, that it is given to us, that we can test the spirits, that we can test anything that comes to us uh, posing as truth, whether it is or isn't. We thank you that, that you give us your word, your living word, and your written word. And we ask that you would search our hearts and prepare the soil of our hearts to receive that word. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel 9, 26. <clears throat> First I'll read 26 and 27, and then it shifts at, at 10, at chapter 10. And after the 62 weeks... Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomin abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Okay, verse, verse 27. We started on verse 27 last week. And we, ha we have a contrast between the true covenant that God gives, which is an eternal covenant that is never broken and never will be broken between his people, both Jew and Gentile. And this false covenant who is made by the one who is described as uh, the people of the prince who is to come, who is described in, in other places as someone who exalts himself in the place of the Almighty, who sets himself up as God, to be worshipped as God. So we have a contrast here. So I'd like to start first with Romans 5, 15 through 21. It, it's describing the true covenant the true con covenant with the true God and the goodness of this uh, <clears throat> because it's important on a covenant, or it's, it's important, sorry, it's important on a contrast to understand both sides so that we have a clear picture of what we're looking at. Romans 5, 15 through 21. But the free gift is not like the offense. In, in Romans 5, uh, in the first four chapters of Romans, Paul has been writing the indictment of God against humanity, Jew and Gentile, uh, that we are all, and concluding that we are all under sin. We're, we're slaves of sin. Some of us more obviously than others, but we're all slaves of sin. We're all slaves of of a selfish nature. We don't have to learn it. We're born with it. Um, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense, speaking of Adam, 
Many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in and justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now verse 20, he says, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. And now, <clears throat> Paul goes into this in a great deal more detail in, as we read on in the book of Romans, and, and it's not our point to deal with that right now. But, but that can be confusing at first reading. Sin that the law entered, that, if, that the offense might abound. What, what does that mean? Does that mean that, and, and Paul asks this rhetorical question, is the law sin? No, the law is not sin, but the law reveals sin. It, it, and and uh, so, some of us have had this experience of being in a cave and the guide flips off the lights and you can't see anything at all. You can, I mean, you literally can't see your hand in front of your face. And, and that's fairly common if, if you're going through a cave for at some point for the guide to, to do that for a few seconds just to kind of have a sense of the profound darkness. Well, the law is a light. Now, if you're in the darkness, you don't know what's out there. You don't know what can hurt you. You don't know what can help you. And if you walk very far in that darkness, I mean, carrying the analogy of the cave, you might step off of a cliff. You might drown. Uh, you, you don't know what's there. You cannot see it. Um, but the law is a light. The law does not cause sin but the law reveals sin and that's what Paul is saying here um, and then Jesus Christ of course his sacrifice is the solution for sin he took that sin upon himself Hebrews 9 27 and 28 again <clears throat> setting up the the contrast between the true covenant of God Hebrews 9 27 28 and it is his point and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once, to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart for sin, for salvation. He came the first time to bear our sins, so that we would have the means of salvation. He, he's coming the second time as, as the fulfillment of the Savior that he came the first time. Okay. Now, setting up the contrast, but in the middle of the week, and speaking of, of this prince of the people, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. That is a week of years, and that's <clears throat> pointed out in some other places. In Daniel 7, 23 through 25, in Revelation 2 and 3, in Revelation 12, 14, all speak of this time period of a week of years or three and a half years or 42 months or 1,260 days. All of those phrases are used to describe that same time period. But I would like to read from Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 through 7, and the context is verses 1 through 8. Revelation 13, and I'll, I'll uh, read some portions of this from 1 through 8. Then I stood on the sand of the sea. This is John speaking. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Sounds kind of similar to uh, some of the imagery that Daniel saw in his visions of the, uh, the beast. 
the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if he had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? This is speaking of that future ruler. And he was given a mouth, the beast, was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months or three and a half years or 1260 days. Verse 6, then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Seven, and it was granted to him, the beast, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. And then he goes on to, to, expl- to clarify whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Now, this is not saying that everybody, every human being that's on the earth at that time will worship the beast. It is saying that he was given authority to make war with the saints and to overcome them so that those who refuse to worship will, in, in probably almost every case, pay with their lives. But they will have eternal life. They will have a position of authority. They will, they will receive great blessing. No matter what tribulation, even in this time of ultimate tribulation, no matter what tribulation we as believers go through, we have the promise of God that those who endure to the end, and he's the one who gives us the power to endure, not we ourselves, will receive his reward. <clears throat> okay, reading on. In the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. In Matthew 24, 15 through 25, and there's a parallel passage in Mark 13, 14 through 23, but I'd like to read from Matthew. Jesus refers to this. And this is <clears throat> something that is speaking of, of the future, but it refers to something that, to the ears of Jesus' original hearers would have been a partial fulfillment near enough in their past that they would have had that that, that in many cases their grandparents or their great-grandparents would have lived through. Matthew 24, 15 through 25. And Jesus is speaking of the last days in this. But many times in prophecy, there is a partial fulfillment that's close to hand, which confirms the ultimate fulfillment, which is further in the future. Matthew 24, 15 through 25. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. I'm going to stop here just for a minute. Now, most of us in modern times, we read that and we think, what in the world is Jesus talking about the abomination of desolation? What kind of mystical language is that? Well, <clears throat> during the time that the Greeks were in control of Israel, before the Romans came to power, there was a Greek ruler, uh, and, and we discussed so, to somewhat earlier in Daniel, who's whose name was Antiochus Epiphanes. His enemies gave him the the nickname Antiochus Amenides, which means Antiochus the Madman. He gave himself the name Antiochus Epiphanes because he was claiming to be the living God. And he had had a statue (coughs) of himself placed in the temple, and, war, and and sacrificed pigs on the altar. Uh, and, and so <clears throat> Jesus' listeners would have recognized this was the abomination of desolation. This, this was the act that just totally desecrated the temple. Uh, and God gave them partial deliverance from a time um, through uh, <clears throat> a group of uh, Pharisees called uh, the sons of Judas Maccabeus, 
the extra biblical uh, book, First and Second Maccabees, is written about their exploits. They they were able for a time until they were overthrown to restore the worship of the temple to uh, <clears throat> to remove those those uh, Greek forces that were holding the temple a- until they were th- they themselves were overcome by the Romans and. Um, <clears throat> To carry it a little further, the Romans decided to learn from the Greeks and decided that, that we are, you know, as the Romans, we don't need that kind of problem. If they want to worship their God, let them worship their God. Because we don't need to have daily riots in the streets. We just don't need that to invest the time and the money and the manpower to, to try to keep calm in that situation. So if they want to worship their God and instead of Caesar, then then let them worship their God. As long as they pay their taxes and main, maintain order, we don't care. Uh, <clears throat> and that continued on for, for quite some time. But Jesus has said that this is pointing to a ultimate fulfillment of sometime in the future of someone who is going to claim to be God, to demand to be worshipped as God. Okay, then reading on from Matthew Verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened and one reason jesus says that <clears throat> that this will be a time of great tribulation such as not ever been there have been many times of great tribulation throughout history i i, I mean uh, you don't really have to go back very far to find genocidal wars going on but in every situation up to this future time if, and if is a huge word, but if you were able to get out of that country, you could go to some place of relative safety. Now, of course, many didn't. Many were slaughtered. But there was at least that option that if you could get out of that country, whether it was Pol Pot's Cambodia, whether it was Castro's Cuba, whether it was Hitler's Nazi Germany, if you could get out of the country, you could go to some place that you would be safe. At this time, there will not be any place that is safe from a worldly standpoint um, <clears throat> because it will be a worldwide dictatorship. Now, almost every dictator has wanted to be a worldwide dictator, but this one is going to achieve what all of the others have wanted to do. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So he's giving us a warning <clears throat> that this will come. There are some additional details in Luke 21, 20 through 24. <clears throat> and these deal more with the, now what we're reading in Matthew and in Mark deal more with what was going, what is going on from a spiritual standpoint. Um, Luke 21, 20 through 24 deals somewhat more with the, the military standpoint of, of what, what, there was a partial fulfillment in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And there will be a more complete fulfillment under a universal worldwide dictatorship. Luke 21, 20 through 24, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days. The idea being that if you're in that situation, you can't run as fast, and it's very, very hard to hide. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And so you had a partial fulfillment of that 
uh, under the Roman general Titus in AD 70, approximately 30 years or so after Jesus uttered this prophecy. And you'll have a more complete uh, <clears throat> uh, fulfillment of that prophecy in, in the, shortly before the return of Jesus Christ to rule and to reign as, as king and lord. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4, you have a, a more complete description of this future world ruler given by the Apostle Paul. And Paul is writing to the Thessalonian churches who have, been, who have had a false teaching going around that, that Jesus had already returned and it was all over. Uh, now, I, I guess living in the world they were living in, they would almost have to conclude that Jesus had been defeated because they were facing severe Roman persecution. So it, it, that was definitely a false teaching that was very discouraging to them if they believed it. Okay, Roman, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together, again, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit, or by word, or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself or revealing himself that he is God or to be God. He, he sits in, in the temple of God, claiming to be God. Um, <clears throat> so that's speaking of a, a future fulfillment and, and, the, uh, <clears throat> and the arrogance and the blasphemy of this future leader. Okay, going back to Daniel 9.27. He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations, and, and wing would signify that the swiftness of that, shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. The consummation of the completion, the fulfillment of that which has been promised, the complete fulfillment. Uh, Isaiah 10, 20 through 23, <coughs> speaks that, Anything that God says will be completely and totally fulfilled. I'd like to read from Matthew 13, 41 through 43. Matthew 13, 41 through 43. Now this is speaking, uh, Jesus has given the disciples and the crowd the parable of the wheat and the tares. And here he's explaining to the disciples. And he says, in 41, the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. Now, now offend in English is it's a rather weak word. <laughs> it, it really is. I mean, we, we use offended. You know, that offended me. Well, the word that's translated offend is, is the Greek word scandalon, from which we get our, our word scandal, and, and it literally refers to the trigger of a snare. It has a bait on it, and if you take that bait, it will trap you with the intent to destroy you. It's not a live trap. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a trap that's intended for your death. Um, <clears throat> so it means that which is intended to destroy us. Um, so they will gather out of his kingdom, God's kingdom, all things that intend to destroy, those, those who are false teachers and those who practice lawlessness. Now, what is lawlessness? It's, it's those, uh, it's the idea of cheap grace. I can live any old way I want because God will forgive me. God will forgive all of our sins. But if we have truly, you know, if we truly turn to him, if we truly have repented and, and come to him, we won't want to live in sin. 
That doesn't mean we're going to live sinless lives. It does mean that our hearts won't be set on that sin. And it means that we'll want to be free from that sin. We won't, to, we won't want to hide behind, well, I can live any way I please and God will forgive me because, you know, because he's a gracious God. So that is, that is lawlessness. And those who practice lawlessness, uh, again, practice to practice anything is you do it over and over again to get really skilled at it. And we'll cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing of gnashing teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So that's the consummation and the, the determined that God has determined these things, that these things that God has determined will come to pass. That deals with the sovereignty of God. Now, <clears throat> people have and do <laughs> get into these long and barbed arguments over the sovereignty of God versus the free will of man. Well, we're kind of looking at two different Aspects And the sovereignty of God is, in a simple term, is to say that God is the sovereign ruler of the universe, and he, his will will be carried out. Now, does that mean that we don't have free will? After all, if I have free will, I can choose to obey or disobey God. And yes, I can, and you can, and we all can. Do we somehow thwart God's plan if we do that? No. We can disobey. <clears throat> we, can, we, can, uh, we can outwardly oppose and actively oppose the will of God in our lives. It doesn't change the will of God. It doesn't change his ultimate plan. Now, it certainly can remove us from his blessing upon us. It can lead to our destruction, but it doesn't change his ultimate plan. Uh, that isn't changed a bit by our, by our uh, refusal to go along with it. Uh, if we go along with his plan, then we receive the blessing of that. If we refuse to go along with that, his plan will still be carried out. We just won't receive the blessing of it. We'll be like the children of Israel <coughs> who wandered in the wilderness and died in the wilderness because they refused to uh, follow God's commands. Okay. Determine Daniel 11, 36 and 45, Daniel eleven thirty six. 36. Now this, again, is speaking of this future, uh, speaking of the same king that we heard about in 2 Thessalonians 2. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done that God's will will be done in verse 45 and he speaking of the same king shall plant his the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain yet he shall come to his end and no one shall help him in the midst of what he thinks is his ultimate triumph he will be destroyed Jeremiah 25, 30, and 31 also speak of God carrying out his will. I'd like to read from Romans 11, 25 through 27. Romans 11, 25 through 27. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and so all Israel will be saved as it is written the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins so God is saying <clears throat> through Paul to the Roman church and, and the Romans were a Gentile church for the most part. There were, there were Jews among it, but it, for the most, it was the capital of, of, uh, of the Roman Empire. So for most of the believers in Rome would have been Gentiles. And <clears throat> Paul is, is uh, speaking to the, 
the thought that some of the Gentile believers at the time had that, that God no longer cared about the Jews that because many of the Jews had rejected Jesus as their Messiah, that God had removed his covenant with the Jews and he was no longer caring about them as, and uh, he had, he had uh, replaced them with the Gentiles. And, and Paul is saying, no, you know, that there is a blindness that has happened to the Jewish people, but, but the, the time will come that they will be saved, that they will turn to Jesus as their Messiah. As he said, the deliverer will come out of Zion. And there he's quoting from Isaiah. And in Revelation 19, verse 20, you have the ultimate rebellion and the ultimate thwarting of it in which you have the beast and the false prophet after leading their ultimate rebellion against the lamb and his followers being thrown alive into the lake of fire. Okay, going on. <clears throat> so God's will, his purpose, will be fulfilled. Chapter 10, 1 through 3. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, two years later, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food. No meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all until three whole weeks were fulfilled. <clears throat> in chapter, in, in verse 1, sorry, Daniel calls himself, uh, again, by the name that he is given, the, the Babylon, uh, Babylonian name he has been given by Nebuchadnezzar, Belteshazzar, in <clears throat> In Daniel 1, verse 7. And then, sorry, excuse me. It says, the message was true. Now, true, the word that's translated true means more than factually accurate. It also means certain or stable, or you can count on it. And we have that, uh, we have that, uh, and that's the primary meaning in the Greek. Um we have that as kind of a secondary meaning in English. Uh, a, a true friend, certainly as somebody who tells you the factual information, but a true friend is someone you can count on. Uh, a true spouse, a, a, a true foundation is something that is level, that's square, it's solid. You can safely build upon it and have confidence that barring a major earthquake or something, it's not going to fall down on your head. Um, so we have that as kind of a secondary meaning in English, but the primary <coughs> meaning in, in the, the Hebrew and the Greek is that it is that which is certain and that which is stable, that which is unchangeable and trustworthy. Daniel 8, 26 speaks of that, where Daniel is speaking of, of the uh, message that he's been given, the vision he's been given is true. I'd like to read from John 14, verse 6. Now, this is probably something that's familiar to, to most of us. Uh, if we've <coughs> heard many quotes, uh, if we've encountered any kind of an evangelistic speaking whatsoever, we've probably heard this. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is saying more than just the words that I say are factually accurate. He's saying, I'm the one you can count on. I'm the one that you're secure in. And it's in the context, verses 1 through 10, of even in the face of death, the ultimate enemy that all of us face, that Jesus is the one who is stable, that we don't have to be uncertain, that we don't have to be insecure, that we can trust in him. And Thomas, I, I love Thomas for answering, for asking this question because I, I think we, you know, if we're honest, we've all asked it in ourselves. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? After, and then Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Then he goes on to explain further. Verse 7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, 
Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father? And the Father in me, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. God is spirit. And, and uh, because God is spirit, he does not have a physical body. But we understand the nature of God the Father through his revelation of himself through Jesus the Son. We, we understand the character, the compassion, the holiness, the righteousness of God as it was revealed in Jesus. In Revelation 19, 9, and 11 through 16, you have a vision of the final battle where the beast and the false prophet lead an army against the Lamb of God and his saints. Revelation 19, 9. And this is where the angel is speaking to John. And he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true, the trustworthy, the stable, the certain sayings of God. Then 11, now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. And it gives a description. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Uh, the beginning of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, which is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <clears throat> and John writes this in such a way that there's absolutely no mistaking the identity of who this rider on the white horse is that's leading this heavenly army. Back to Daniel. In verse 1. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. Now, that the word that's translated long is translated latter days. The time appointed is the latter days in Daniel 10, 14, where an angel is speaking to Daniel. Now, I've come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, the latter days or the long days the time that is long. It's, it's the same word. And it's a very similar verse. And had understanding, he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. To understand, it's, it's kind of a mental picture of a, <clears throat> are you a picky eater? Do you know somebody who's a picky eater? Do you have a son or daughter who's a, picky eater or, or, you know, granddaughter, grandson, friend. And, you know, they have mixed vegetables. There's certain things in them they like and certain things they don't. Well, they don't just grab a spoon and eat them. No, okay, I like peas, so I'll pick out the peas. I like carrots, so I'll pick out the carrots. I don't like corn, so that's going to go off to the side. However, understanding is the ability to discern and to pick out. Only in this case, it's a lot more significant than peas and carrots and corn in your mixed vegetables. It's truth and error. It's the matter of, of judging the teachings and, and that we get, that we receive from life, and, and judging them by the standard of truth, which is the word of God, the living word and the written word, so that we hang on to the truth, we embrace the truth, we plant the truth of the word in our hearts so that it'll grow. And we reject that which is false. In Daniel 1, 17, this is when Daniel and his friends were chosen to serve in the Babylonian government. 
and you have the same word of understanding. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. He was able to discern, to pick out, to select, and to hold fast to that which is true. In Daniel 8, 16, it also speaks of that understanding. And that's something that God desires for all of us to have. And he gives us the means for that through a careful and prayerful consideration of his words, comparing one scripture to another. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, nor meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So we have a description here of Daniel's fast. <clears throat> it was a fast for three weeks. He says, no, uh, <clears throat> scholars disagree, and, and I, don't, I don't know the answer to this myself, <laughs> so I'm not going to come in and say the one is right and the other is wrong. Scholars disagree as to whether Daniel's fast was a total fast in terms of any food at all because it said, I it ate no pleasant food. So it at least leaves open the option that he did eat things that weren't particularly desirable. That fast was for a purpose, and and fasting is not just about not eating food or not doing something else. I, I mean, fast doesn't have to be from food. It can be from, from anything, just about. It can be from electronics. It can be from uh, a hobby. It can be from just anything. But the purpose of a fast is not just to abstain from that, but it is to devote that time and that energy to seeking an understanding of the will of God in our lives. Uh, and when I don't understand the will of God, when we don't understand the will of God, a lot of, it's not that God doesn't want to reveal his will to us. It's that a lot of times we're just so busy with other things that we don't really have time we don't take the time to listen. So the purpose of fasting is for that. Um, we have other things that crowd in that try to steal our affections. And so it's possible um, that when he says, I ate no pleasant food, it, it might mean that he ate no food at all for three weeks, which is a really long period of time to eat nothing at all. Or it's also possible that he ate food, but, but maybe just like bread and water and not good homemade bread. <laughs> That wouldn't be much of a fast at all. Uh, <clears throat> but that he ate food, but not really anything that was very desirable. Uh, plain oatmeal. Now, you may like plain oatmeal, and you may not. And I like oatmeal, but only if it's got a bunch of stuff in it. <laughs> you just boil me up some oats and, and uh, put them in front of me in a bowl with, with no sugar with no syrup, with no raisins or no fruit or uh, no milk. Well, I can eat it. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm hungry enough to right now. but And that may have been the, been the case. But Daniel was fasting in order to have understanding, to be able to discern through looking at God's word, to, to be able to understand what God was wanting him to convey to his people. Amen. Father, we thank you so much that you work in us, that you desire for us to understand your will. We, under, we trust that you will keep us safe in you, either from or through trials. And we thank you that we can trust in you in that. We ask that you'd work in the hearts of all these who hear these words. That we would be willing to, to set aside those things that would be distractions, that would, that would make it hard for us to hear and to understand and to discern your desires for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you very much. God bless you.